I'm Larry Walther. This is principlesofaccounting.com chapter 19. We're looking at job costing and modern cost management systems. In previous modules, we considered timesheets and material requisition forms and job cost sheets, and we looked at how that cost was accumulated to give us the cost of a job. Now we're going to look at how those same costs flow through our general journal and ledger. In other words, our ledger system for capturing the costs of jobs. And so let's begin by considering how costs flow through a system. This matches the illustration in the textbook where we're manufacturing gears from some pipe. And so when we buy the pipe, we're buying the raw material from a supplier, it goes into our raw materials inventory category. At some point, we begin to process that pipe. We transfer it into production, so the raw material inventory is decreased and our work in process is increasing. When the process is complete, we move those same costs into the finished goods inventory and ultimately onto a customer the cost become cost of goods sold as the goods are removed from finished goods. So that sort of describes the physical flow of the cost. Let's look at an actual numeric example focusing just on the materials for the moment. We buy $10,000 of raw material. We will increase our raw materials inventory. When we put it into production, we'll decrease raw materials and increase work in process. When it's complete, we'll decrease work in process and increase finished goods. And when we sell it to a customer, we'll decrease finished goods and increase the cost of goods sold. Now, in the ledger, using T-accounts, when we buy the goods from the supplier, we'll debit raw materials inventory, credit accounts payable or cash. When we transfer the cost from raw materials, we'll credit raw materials and debit work in process. When we finish the process, we'll credit work in process and debit finished goods. And when we sell the goods to a customer, we will credit finished goods and we'll debit cost of goods sold. So there are T-accounts showing the flow of that $10,000 cost through the various categories of inventory. Let's look at it in journal entry form. When we buy the material, we'll debit raw materials and credit accounts payable. When we transfer the pipe into production, we'll debit work in process and credit raw material. This just exactly matches the T accounts. When we transfer the goods to finished goods, we'll debit finished goods inventory and credit work in process. And then lastly, we'll debit cost of goods sold and credit finished goods when we deliver the goods to a customer. Direct labor requires the same process. Assume that this job required 200 hours at $15 an hour. We put the $3,000 of labor cost into work in process, crediting salaries payable. We transfer the cost to finished goods, debit finished goods, credit work in process. These are the same accounts, just a different cost component now. And when we sell the goods, we'll increase cost of goods sold and remove that cost from finished goods. Overhead is the third cost component. I'm assuming we're applying overhead at $25 per direct labor hour based on our predetermined application rate. So as we incur 200 hours of direct labor, we'll assign at $25 an hour, $5,000 to work in process. We're crediting factory overhead here. We'll, we'll look at the factory overhead account more later. For now, just focus on the debit to work in process for the cost allocated. When we finish the goods, we'll transfer that same $5,000 of cost to finish goods inventory and finally on to cost of goods sold. So in the aggregate, what we've got are materials, labor, and overhead being assigned to work in process based on the actual cost incurred or allocated in the case of overhead. That $18,000 total cost for the job is moved to finished goods when the goods are completed and eventually on to cost of goods sold as the goods are delivered to customers. So it's a fairly logical process, the same way the goods are physically moving between raw materials and work in process and finished goods and cost of goods sold, so are the cost tracking within the general ledger. To be sure you're understanding the flow of the cost through the system, if our accounting period ended and we had not yet put the raw materials into production, we would show inventory of $10,000 on our balance sheet. On the other hand, if the material was in process, but only half of the necessary labor had been performed, we would have had the 10,000 of direct materials, we would have had $1,500 of labor, and then the application rate, $2,500 of applied overhead. We would have had $14,000 in the work in process account. All the materials, half the labor, and half the overhead being applied at that point. So if our financial statement date came up and ended right there, we'd report work in process 14,000. If, on the other hand, the gears were completed but unsold, we would have 18,000 in finished goods. That's all the material, labor, and overhead combined, the $18,000. If we sold those goods, finally, 
what we would have is nothing on the balance sheet any longer for those items, but we would have our $25,000 sales price minus our $18,000 cost of goods sold so that we would report $7,000 of gross profit on that particular transaction. So this is the general ledger system, but we also need to think about maintaining subsidiary accounts. We couldn't just put all of our costs together into one set of control accounts. We need to know for a business with hundreds of jobs ongoing, we need to be able to know or be able to identify how much cost is associated with each job. You've been exposed to subsidiary ledgers when you studied accounts receivable where we said we need to know our customers owe us 100000 in total, but we need to be able to identify which customers owe us that for purposes of billing and collection. And so here I've got job A, which is account number 600.01, 35,000 in process. Job B, 600.0101, 25,000 work in process, and all the way through so that I would know that my total work in process was 290,000 for all jobs. So account numbering sequences help this process. So when we debit work in process, we might have a sub account or subsidiary account system to be able to subdivide our total into the amounts by specific jobs. I'd like to close this module by mentioning the term transfer pricing, which is very significant, especially in global business context. Transfer pricing issues revolve around how to assess costs and set prices for goods produced in one venue and transferred to an, an affiliated company in another venue. Measuring cost, determining job cost, allocating overhead, all of this is used to determine costs, and when you determine costs, and you transfer those goods to another affiliated company, the cost level that you identify and assign is going to determine the profit earned by the producing affiliate and therefore the amount of tax they pay. So it doesn't take too much thought to see how someone might have an incentive to try to make their profits earned in low tax venues and, and maybe not so much so in high tax venues. As a result, the rules attempt to require fair and equitable job costing and that transfers between entities be based on arm's length pricing. Issues revolve around divisional profit incentives as well. If you've got divisional managers that compete with one another, uh, you can see how they might argue about the costs that are attributable to products they produce in terms of trying to determine their profits for purposes of measuring their bonuses and so forth. So transfer pricing is a very big issue. The cost accounting system, the job cost system needs to support, again, a fair and equitable process for determining and assigning costs to products. Despite the arbitrary nature of certain allocations, in the aggregate it ought to be reflective of the actual cost incurred by the organization in producing what they deliver to another customer or affiliated entity.